Good morning, boys and girls. We're going to be reading chapter 15 this morning, and it is titled The Witch's Castle. So last we read, they were running away from Kalidas, which is a type of creature in The Wizard of Oz, and they got to a field of flowers and realized that they gave off a poisonous, I guess, aroma and it put them all to sleep. So, we'll have to see. Chapter 15 is called The Witch's Castle. Alex and Connor awoke to the sound of sniffling. They were so groggy, they couldn't tell if they were awake or still dreaming. They're dead. They're dead and it's all my fault, someone cried. I should have known better than to take them into that poppy field. Now they'll never make it to the witch's castle and I shall never get a heart. The twins sat up and looked around. They were in a grassy field beside a stream. All their friends were sound asleep on the ground near them. Mother Goose was snoring so loudly, it was a wonder the others could sleep through it. The tin woodman was sitting on a boulder by the stream, crying buckets and buckets of tears into his hands. The twins helped each other to their feet and walked over to him. Mr. Woodman, are you all right? Alex asked. No, I'm not all right. The tin woodman cried, but never looked up. I just led the wizard's associates straight to their doom. They breathed too much of the deadly poppy poison, and now they'll never wake up. I'll never get a heart, and I will never love or fear or laugh or be sad again. Alex and Connor shared a smile. Mr. Woodman, you can dry your tears, Alex said happily. We're awake. Is that you, Alex? the tin woodman asked, but still didn't look up. Yes, it's me, Alex said. My brother and I are up, and I'm sure the others aren't far behind. Oh, that's wonderful, he said. I thought I had lost you all forever. Despite the good news, the tin woodman stayed in the same sorrowful position with his hands covering his eyes. Dude, are you okay? Connor asked. I'm afraid I've cried myself into a rust the tin woodman said. Be a friend and fetch my oil can, will you? Connor retrieved the oil can tied to Lester's reins and oiled the tin woodman's joints. He was so happy to see the twins were awake, he gave them each a tight squeeze. The others started waking up too. They yawned and stretched and grew curious once they realized their surroundings had changed. What happened to us? asked Jack. The deadly poppies put you to sleep, the tin woodman said. I carried all of you as far away from the meadow as I could. I was afraid I was too late, but you're all alive and all is well. The tin woodman jumped happily, causing a loud clank when his metal body hit the ground. You carried all of us here by yourself? Goldilocks asked. Oh, certainly not, the tin woodman said. The field mice helped me. Everyone suddenly froze. They hadn't realized at first but the ground was covered in thousands of tiny mice that blended into the dirt. Red let out a piercing scream and all the mice scattered into the nearby trees. How did you convince a bunch of field mice to help you? Jack asked. As I was dragging the twins out of the meadow first, I came upon the field mice queen, the tin woodman explained. She was being chased by a wildcat and had almost caught her, but luckily I intervened and sliced off the wildcat's head before it ate her. As a thank you, she ordered all her subjects to help me bring you all to safety. Oh, the twins said in unison. They had forgotten the field mice helped Dorothy and her friends escape the poppies in the original story. Still, it was an odd thing to comprehend. You let mice touch me while I was sleeping? Red yelled. Who do I look like, Cinderella? That is absolutely disgusting. You should have just left me in the meadow. Mother Goose got to her feet and did a couple windmill stretches. Her joints popped like firecrackers. What a snooze! How long were we out for? Two days, the tin woodman said. Oh no, Connor shouted. That's terrible, Alex said, and she started to panic. That means we've lost our head start on Lloyd. He could already be there by now, recruiting the Wicked Witch and her army. Then let's get to the Winky Country right away. Goldilocks said. Without wasting another minute, the tin woodman raced to the yellow brick road and the others hurried after him. 
They sprinted as fast as their bodies would carry them and ran off the remaining drowsiness from their poppy-induced sleep. Look, the Emerald City, the Tin Woodman pointed out. Winky Country is just on the other side of it. We're nearly there. A bright greenish glow filled the sky above the city in the horizon. A massive gate had been built around the city and was covered in emeralds and jewels that twinkled so brightly in the sun it was almost blinding. Alex wished with all her heart that she could travel beyond the gates and see the spectacular city for herself, but they didn't have a moment to spare. Perhaps in the future, she and her brother could return to Oz under more enjoyable circumstances and see the Emerald City, but the longer it took them to get to Winky Country, the less likely it became. They traveled past the Ozian capital and journeyed a few miles west. The grassy fields around them became less and less lush until the grass died out completely. All they could see in the distance were rough, rocky hills. They knew immediately when they had entered Winky Country because the yellow brick road came to a dead end. Why is there no road through the Winky Country? Goldilocks asked. Because no one wishes to go there, the Tin Wood Man said matter-of-factly. Then how will we find the Wicked Witch if there is no path? Jack asked. Usually the Wicked Witch knows you've entered her country from the moment you step foot on Winky Ground, the Tin Woodman said. She has one eye, but it, is, but it is as powerful as a telescope, and she can see many miles away from her castle. We don't have to find her. She'll find us. They all paused before going any farther and fearfully looked out at the unfriendly land ahead. No one wanted to take the first step. Don't everyone go at once now, Mother Goose said. I nominate the Tin Woodman to go first, Red said. It's his world, after all. We can't lose our guide, Jack said. Then I'll go first, Alex said. But no one is going into the Winky Country unarmed. She snapped her fingers, and buckets of water appeared in all their hands and Lester's beak. Her friends looked down at them curiously. What are these for? Goldilocks asked. Spoiler alert, Connor said. Water melts the witch. Alex tiptoed to the very edge of the yellow brick road. She took a deep breath and stepped onto the dirt of Winky Country. The entire group suddenly gasped and shielded themselves, but nothing happened. A few moments passed and there was still no sign of the Wicked Witch. Perhaps the border receded, Red said. Take another step. Alex took a second step. Once again, everyone covered themselves, but it was unnecessary. She walked several feet into the Winky Country, but there was no retaliation. The witch is a no-show. What's plan B? Mother Goose asked. I've heard you can find the witch's castle if you just follow the sun as it sets in the west, the Tin Woodman said. Okay, then, Mother Goose said. You all heard the man. Onward, ho! The twins and their friends traveled straight into Winky territory together. It was some of the most stressful steps any of them had ever taken. They expected to be attacked at any minute by one of the wicked witch's wolves or crows or bees or flying monkeys, but an assault never came. They traveled for miles and miles into the west with no sign of anything. The dry and uneven land was completely deserted. They didn't even see a single winky. As the sun started to descend, it was easy to predict where it would set, and they headed in that direction. Just as the sun disappeared into the horizon, the witch's castle came into view. There it is, the tin woodman called to the others. The castle was not the dark and intimidating fortress they had expected, but was rather pleasant and traditional. It had towers and flags and sat on top of a cliff overlooking the West Country. Even more surprising, there was nothing to stop them from nearing it. The twins and their friends inched up a steep path to the castle's entrance. The drawbridge had already been lowered, and they cautiously crossed it and entered the castle without any trouble. The entire country was empty. I don't like this one bit, Connor said. This is definitely a trap. Any minute now we'll be attacked by the witch's horrible creatures. Even as his anxious voice echoed through the halls of the castle, not a single soul revealed itself. They traveled through the vacant castle and found a long throne room. It had high windows that offered impressive views of the dreary land surrounding it. I don't get it, Connor said as he looked around the throne room. Where is everyone? 
Isn't it obvious? Alex said with a sigh. Our uncle got here before us. He recruited the witch and her army. We're too late. Defeated, Alex had a seat on the wicked witch's throne. Suddenly, a winged creature flew out from under the seat in a panic. It was frightened and moved so fast, none of them could tell what it was. It flew toward a window, but didn't realize the window was closed, and it smashed into the glass. The creature fluttered to the floor and started whimpering. They gathered around it and stared in awe. It was a small monkey, no larger than a cat. He had plump, rosy cheeks, brown fur, and wore a tiny vest. A pair of bat-like wings grew out of his back. It's a baby flying monkey, Red said with delight. Hello there, little fella. You are the cutest thing I've seen since we got here. The baby screeched and lunged at them, trying to defend himself from the newcomers. However, the monkey was more frightened than anyone, and his efforts only made him seem more adorable. That's all right, little guy. We aren't going to hurt you, Connor said. A banana magically appeared in Alex's hand, and she handed it to him. The monkey was very grateful for the food and ate the whole thing in just a few bites. Alex got to her knees and smiled at him. Can you talk? she asked. Yes, the monkey said with a high voice like a toddler's. What's your name? Bluebo, the monkey said. What happened, Bluebo? Alex asked. Why are you here all by yourself? She was calm and friendly. He knew there was no reason to fear her. A man came to see the witch in the castle, Bluebo said. He had a bag of books with him and a pair of sparkly silver shoes. He told the witch he had killed the Wicked Witch of the East and taken them from her. And if the witch wanted them, she would have to help him. You're doing a great job, Bluebo, Alex said. Can you remember what the man asked the witch for? The monkey batted his eyes at her. Can I have another banana first? He asked. Certainly, Alex said. She snapped her fingers and a bowl of bananas appeared. Bluebo went to town as he finished the story. He was much more animated now that he had something in his stomach. The man told the witch he knew she wanted the silver shoes, the monkey said. He said if she let him use her army of winkies and wolves and crows, bees and flying monkeys, he would give her the shoes. The wicked witch agreed and they all left. These are great bananas, by the way. Do you know where they went? Alex asked. The man took a book out of his bag and poured this funny blue water on it, he said. The book magically lit up. Then all the winkies and wolves and crows and bees and flying monkeys and the wicked witch followed the man inside. The twins looked at their friends with worried eyes. This was what they'd feared. Why did you stay behind? Connor asked. The wicked witch wears a golden cap that controls the flying monkeys, Bluebo said. But I am young and the cap has no control over me. I stayed behind. My family was forced to go against their will. I hope they'll be all right. Did they leave the book behind? Alex asked. The man had the wicked witch order me to throw it off the castle's balcony when they were gone, he said. The man said he had to get rid of it because others would be looking for it. Why is Lloyd discarding the books he's traveling into? Jack asked. Your grandmother said the books are the only way in and out of each story. He saw us in Kansas during the cyclone, Connor said. He knows we're following him into the stories. He must have another way home if he's getting rid of the books. But how is that possible? Goldilocks asked. They all fell silent for a moment as they each thought about it. What else could the twin's uncle have that would give him access to the fairy tale world? I know, Red said. Charlie had a book called A Treasury of Fairy Tales in his library. It had all of our stories inside of it, although I didn't care for the illustrations of me. I bet he's going to use the portal portion on it to get back to our world. This gave their uncle an even greater advantage. He could move freely between worlds rather than following the rules of the potion like the twins and their friends were forced to. Connor went to the nearest window and searched for the balcony. We have to find the book, he said. That might take us forever. No, it won't, Bluebo said. Like I said, the golden cap doesn't work on me, so I didn't have to follow the witch's orders. I hid the book instead. Where? Alex asked. May we see it? The monkey thought it over. If I give it to you, 
Will you defeat the wicked witch and free my family from her? He looked up at them with large, desperate eyes. The twins couldn't promise him anything, but they needed the book desperately. We can promise to try, Alex said. There are a lot of people we're hoping to save by going after this man. A lot of families just like yours will be helping. Lubo looked back and forth at them. He reached into his vest and pulled out a small book with a green cover. He handed it to Alex and she read the title. Her eyes grew wide. Peter Pan, she told the others. He's going to Neverland next. What's in Neverland? Goldilocks asked. Captain Hook and the pirates are, Connor said with a heavy heart. The others didn't have to ask the twins any questions to know this made their situation go from bad to worse. Then let's go after them, Jack said. We won't solve anything by sitting around the castle. They huddled together and formed the next phase of their plan. Since we don't have an alternative way home like our uncle, someone needs to stay in Oz and keep an eye on the wonderful Wizard of Oz book and the Peter Pan book we travel into, Connor said. I'll stay. Goldilocks said. Then I'm staying too, Jack said. Jack, I'll be perfectly fine in the castle, she argued. They'll need one of us with them. I'm not leaving the mother of my unborn child, Jack said. If they should need us, we'll only be a book away. It was settled. Connor pulled out the yellow book tucked in the back of his belt and gave it to Jack and Goldilocks to look after. Alex placed the green book on the floor in the center of the room and flipped it open. As expected, a bright beam of light shot directly out of it and up to the high ceiling of the castle. I have a feeling there's a lot more to you people than what I've been told, the tin woodman said. He had been quiet up to this point, but seeing the book magically light up forced him to break his silence. We may have skipped a few of the details, Connor said sheepishly. Can you still give me a heart as promised? he asked hopefully. Sure, Connor said but it may take us a little longer than we realized. If I assist you further in your quest, could it give me a heart faster? The Tin Woodman said. Alex and Connor looked at each other and shrugged. It couldn't hurt, Alex said. Then I am at your service, the Tin Woodman said. The twins, Red, Mother Goose, Lester, and the Tin Woodman stood in a circle around the beam of light. Is everyone ready? Alex asked. The others gave each other the others each gave her a confident nod. Here we go again, Connor said. Next stop, Neverland. All right, so that was chapter 15. Check back for the next uh, video, boys and girls, which will be chapter 16, which is called Ditching the Darling. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I can't wait to see you guys. Bye.